Welcome to Tabletop Gaming Guild. Tabletop Gaming Guild is all about the experiences and memories that playing games with friends and families can create. On this episode, we will be talking about Slippery Rock Con. I have something to share. You know how in the very first episode that you guys talked to me, I think it was 13, huh? Yeah. I mentioned the chain was testing a digital register system. That's now live, and all the stores are using the same system. The technology to actually do multi-store functionality is not 100% there. We can easily see what some of the other stores have in stock, request books now. That is cool. Also, I have bad news for you and me, Nathan. Somebody bought the store's copy of Tapestry. Was it Jim? Did he buy it for me? <laughs> oh, no, I didn't get it. That system allows you to see what's in other stores and share those easily, right? That's a function that's still coming, actually. It's called Comic Hub, and it's designed to meet the needs of comic retailers. So it's really good with books. So if somebody was missing a book, I can go in there and I can see whether or not one of the other stores has it in stock. I can call them up and get it. The gaming half of the store is still a little bit of work in progress. I think the customers that are linked into the website can actually browse my inventory. Just not everything's there because it's only been live since the middle of October. I'm actually surprised Tapestry lasted as long as it did on your shelf. It was a higher ticket item for our store. I figured either it was going to leave during the Black Friday sale or... You or me were going to grab it after, but neither of those things happened. Yeah, I was debating during the Black Friday sale. That's really cool. If you spend 50 bucks, you get 25% off. I like it. That's really easy for gamers to achieve. Get one thing. If it's a big box <laughs> game, yeah, one thing will get you there. Maybe I should send my proxy buyer. <laughs> uh, by that, do you mean this gentleman on the other half of my screen? <laughs> I do. They do have the wingspan with the extra pack inside of it. I currently have three copies of the second edition of Wingspan in the store. I'm hoping to move at least a couple of those. Yeah, I'm sure you will. I'm surprised they stayed around. They'll be gone by the Black Friday one, though. I have my suspicions. Those bird-watching weirdos, I tell you. I'm sorry, aren't you one of those bird-watching weirdos? <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get too far into this, maybe we should actually talk about what Slipper Rock Con is real quick. So Slipper Rock Con is an annual convention in Slipper Rock. It was held at Campy Coco, and it's in benefit of the Slipper Rock Library. It's a three-day convention. I think the most relevant thing to our discussion is the fact that all three of us were there at the same place at the same time. It was a confluence. Yes. So not only is it a cool convention, but we were all there. So that was awesome. And we were able to play some games together. This was the first time I met Dan in person. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go ahead and get this started off. Three days convention, made it for Friday and Saturday. I was just there for Saturday. I managed to finagle my schedule to just get away for the one day. We ran a bunch of games Friday. Friday was definitely a little slower, but Saturday was really busy. Both of you guys effectively ran board games those two days, right? Yes. I had two going at one time and all the tables were pretty much full. I don't know if it was true, but I was pleasantly surprised to hear there was more board gamers than RPGers. There were a ton of RPGers at that con. Board gamers beat the RPGers. I'm happy. For the truth of the record, this con taking place outside at a camp had so many live action style events. This would be the sort of place where you'd play live action Star Wars. And by the way, live action Star Wars is the sort of game you play with paintball guns. Yeah, they had live action Star Wars, had vampire live action World War II. I can't consider them part of the RPGers. So lots of stuff going on, but we're going to talk about what we saw, which is board games. The only thing important. I mean, what? <laughs> but what was your favorite game that you played during the convention there, Dan? Oh, well, I hate to start off on the right foot, but how about Mansions of Madness? Oh my, that is the greatest game. <laughs> I love that game so much. I was hoping we would work <laughs> up to that one. Like we talked about the other games that you guys ran, whatever actually got played. Because, you know, me and Nathan, we played Here's a Land and Sea. And you and me played Istanbul there. That was almost in between game sessions. So maybe we should just cut you off? Yes. Let's go ahead and start off with the simple Istanbul, because I know you already played it before. I have not. All right, that's a good start, because I haven't played Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. So in Istanbul, it's like a racist style game. Not race-ist, but race style game. <laughs> right. Istanbul is a... <laughs> <laughs> Istanbul is a race game where you try to get as many gems as you possibly can. 
you get them by going to different places on the board and you try to get the goods or money to purchase the gems or you can also pay for actions that you cheat at the dice rolling or let you retrieve one of your assistants back but in general it's just a race game so the first person to hit their max of gems wins an interesting game the most efficient person definitely 100 percent always wins but there's a lot you could do to throw someone off like just putting your guy in the way if you have your main worker placed in a place they want to go, then they have to pay that person two lira. And that could throw them off because if you buy three of the wheel cart pieces, you get a gem. So if they're trying to get seven money to be able to do that, you will effectively throw them off a turn because they can't go to the spot they want to to procure the money to get what they need. So they'll have to think of a third route. So just those little actions in Istanbul can make the game interesting. And I do think that experience is a must for the game so if you play the game and you have a whole bunch of new players play you, you gotta let them not try to crush them or anything at work we played it a ton and we got to the point where we could do stuff like that and it was really fun i just don't know like off the bat if istable's worth the investment to get to that point because just out of the gate it's okay what do you think dan Istanbul is a very solid game. I will grant you that. I guess I can't laud it too highly because it was a previous own for me. I'll get back to that, though. So I think the game is actually quite intricate. You've got this worker movement mechanism. So you start on a tile and you can move one or two places orthogonally in any direction. And then the tile that you stop at, you can leave off a worker and take that action. But you can double back on your route. So if you land on a tile where you've already left off one of your workers, you get to pick it up. And that saves you from having going back to the fountain whose action is to recall all your workers. Yeah, I think that's a really nice piece that you only have so many assistants. So you have to plan out what you want to do pretty well because you don't want to return to the fountain. If you return to the fountain, you effectively lost a turn. Yeah, sometimes it has to be done. There's tons of ways to mitigate that in the game. You can unlock an extra worker disc going to the one mosque tile. You can get another mosque tile that provides a special power of during your turn, you can pay two coins to take a worker off of a place that you've previously visited and put it on the bottom of your current stack, effectively giving you an extra move sometime later. There's just a lot of like little intricacies like that in the game. You can play a card to get one resource of any kind or five coins. The Kenervasary allows you to draw from the discard pile for those bonus cards, which is super good because if somebody plays a really good bonus card, you can be just like, oh, can I make it over there? Can I get that? That's another thing the game gets really intricate about is they cost the least amount for the first person. Then they technically cost the same, but you have to have more of a resource available to get it. So it still costs one of that type of resource. The first person there has to have two of that resource available, even though they're only spending one. The next person, three next person four and you do get a gem if you get both so it gets into that really subtle part of the game where you're trying to screw someone over by getting there even if you don't need it just to keep them from getting their second one the game encourages people to do things early because it's easier to get the mosque tiles early it's easier to get new gems early yeah. because that's when they're going to be cheapest at the two markets because every time someone takes a gem it reveals an extra space on the board and the cost of the gem goes up in either coins or resources so i rated this game a seven which is a hundred percent solid for me i just decided that i wanted to get rid of it to open up space for something new in my collection once i had probably more than a dozen plays with it yeah, the only thing negative I can say about Istanbul is I think it is 100% group dependent. If it doesn't fit in, it's just not going to work out. But if it does, and people are willing to invest a lot of time into it, it can be an awesome game. What's the potential for AP here? Your choices are pretty much locked into your strategy. So if you're trying a certain strategy, someone thwarts it, it's pretty obvious what you want to do as a side strategy. But again, it gets back to that economy thing. You have to be very economic with your moves. If you're planning your move when it's your turn, you're going to lose. You need to know what you're going to do the whole time and have a clear strategy. So a lot of it has to do with making sure you have more gems at any point of the game. And if you don't, try to figure out the fastest way that you can at least catch up and surpass them. Especially if you fall a couple gems behind, then you're not going to win. And if they get to that fourth gem, even if you actually start slowing them down, you still have to think about getting your gem fast because there's just so many other options. Like you can get money 
They can get resources. They can do both, and you could get to a point where you can't stop them. This is a game where someone could hypothetically plan out two to three turns worth of actions, and if nobody messes with them, they're going to be able to carry it out. More often than not, opportunities present themselves which change your plans. So somebody goes to the post office and all of a sudden the jewelry, which is the blue resource, becomes available at the post office. There's only a couple ways to get those, so maybe I'm going over there now instead. Or if you're in a corner then you can only hit maybe five other possible locations with your two moves. Maybe only two of them are good to you. At some points in the game, the choice is constrained to being obvious and other places they're much more open and fluid so i guess probably good with that or we can move on to uh heroes of red dragon oh oh I, did you play red dragon in damn no the only one i played was land air and sea but if you played red dragon in with some live people go ahead and tell us about no, it. no they were pretty much dead yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry the con was half zombies but we are not biased against the living impaired exactly you gotta be equal opportunity <laughs> Actually, I'm surprised that there wasn't any zombie cosplay there. I didn't leave the building, so there, there, there could have been. been. I know there was Wheel of Time cosplayers. They were the Ashaman. That was cool. As the only one in this group that's read the Wheel of Time, but that's okay. <laughs> Heathens. <laughs> they had some good discounts on games there. Red Dragon, I heard about it and thought I'd try it out, but it's a game simulating drinking games. It's like Tavern Munchkin. Basically, yes. It's a really hardcore take that game where every turn you can play cards that affect other people's drinks or make them lose fortitude. And at the end of your turn, you always have to flip over a card to see what you end up drinking and how much your alcohol content in your system goes up. And they also throw in gambling rounds. So if you happen to have a card that allows you to continue gambling, you're still in the game. As soon as you're like out of cards to help you keep gambling, you're out of the round. Last person with a gambling card wins the round and get all the money. It's a really, really simple game. Pure take that. I would have thought I would have hated this game, but it was actually a lot of fun. As in the same camp, this is generally the game that I would hate. Don't like Munchkin. I don't like any of the games that are Munchkin-esque where you run out of take that card so the other guy wins. I will say that Red Dragon Inn has that, but I think it handles it a little bit better. I mean, it's still there, but you yourself as a player, unlike Kill Dr. Lucky or Munchkin, have a personalized asymmetric deck of cards that seem to balance really well with the other players. Yes. So even if the other players are attacking you, you still deploy some strategy to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. I did like that a lot about it. And Kill Dr. Lucky, if you get screwed over by the other players, you need one less point to take him out next time, and it's cumulative. That's a step up from Munchkin. Wasn't quite enough for me, although it's a fine game. Red Dragon in, I went into it thinking, eh, and I did like that part. I think one of the things that makes it work a little bit better is at the beginning of the game, you're really doing heavy take that, but once your fortitude really gets close to your alcohol content, you're concerned about survival. So it's more about protecting yourself rather than just just like being nasty and trying to take out the other person there is an element of self-preservation and strategy as you were saying munchkin it's hard to get cards and kill dr lucky it's even harder to get cards you have to be in a spot that dr lucky can't see you and the other players and you finally get your card in red dragon in you could cycle through your deck discards at the beginning and draw up to what five or something and yes there's not a shortage of cards so it seems more like you have a full hand of hate or protection or both. So you have a lot of things you can do. You can drop the cards that you don't want. If I don't really want to attack Nathan much longer because he's almost completely like passed out, I will uh, get defensive cards so that I can win. Yeah. You'll knock yourself out. So why do I need to keep attack cards? So there's a lot to the game. I, too, have played this at least once at Board Game Club at the store. I seem to recall similar experiences where the cards were constantly flowing into your hand, so you always had good options mm -hmm. on your turn and not on your turn. Mess with someone or protect yourself, but I think that's the mechanism that makes it different than these other Take That games, because I don't have a big issue with Dr. Lucky. I won't play Munchkin anymore because I played to death back in the day, yeah. but I didn't have a problem with this game either. One thing for anybody who seems interested in buying this game, you almost need to get two copies of it. There's a dozen different base games you can get. Each one comes with four different characters, which means you're max four players. But this game feels like the more players, the better. And each different set you get allows you to have more players. If you have one set, you have four players. You have two sets, you have eight players. And you have all these extra effects that you're throwing in that change up the game. Yeah. 
Yeah, you have a wider selection of player special abilities with the extra sets. And the one time we played it, we played it with just one base set, but it wasn't base set one. We had some weird like races and classes in the game that wasn't like their standard fare. And that actually made it a little bit more interesting. It also gives it a lot more replayability. Otherwise, you're just playing essentially the same four characters over and over again. Yep. I've had heard of people going meta with this game and actually making it into a drinking contest. That might be interesting, but you might die of alcohol poisoning from this game. Someone's buying the alcohol, I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) That game was a surprising game for me. I'm very picky in my games. If they're not a Euro, they generally get a hard pass for me, but I do try to play every game at least once. And that game was fun. Also, Survive. Survive was a lot of fun. I don't know if you ever played that game, Dan. Survive Escape from Atlantis, the full title. That's the one where loading meeples into boats and you're controlling the shark. and They get eaten. I haven't played it, but I've heard stories. Full disclosure, I don't think I won any of those games, but I still liked it. Talk about cutthroat. I've heard this is extremely cutthroat. Oh, yeah. Basically, you have this island that you start out with at different terrain types. And at the beginning of the game, you in turn place your meeples on it. So you're placing your meeples, and at the beginning of the game, you get to see what value they have. After you place them on the map, you're never allowed to look at them again. So when the game starts, you get three actions. You can move your meeple up to three times. If it's water, you can only move the meeple once, but you still can move like two other meeples. Then you take a tile off the board. So you're going to take these sand tiles off. If there's a player's piece on the sand tile that go in the water, and then you look at the tile, there's tiles that give you like defensive actions, and there's tiles that happen immediately. The really cool ones are whirlpools, and they suck all the other meeples in, and some of them deploy sharks that you can move the shark. And there's whales that take out the boats. So basically, you are trying to race your people to one of the four points on the board, which are all at the beginning guarded by dragons and have meeples with highest point values totaled at the end. Pretty simple. It's a lot of fun. All the fun in the game is killing Nathan. Yeah. We should talk about when you roll this dice at the end of your turn. I did forget about the die, yeah. And that gives you the ability to move the sharks or whales, and sharks eat people that are in the water. Whales sink ships. If you move a dragon, it sinks ships and eats all the people. But, yeah, really fun game. Yeah, and there's sneaky towels in there, too. Like, one of them lets a swimmer move three spaces when a swimmer is only normally able to move one when they're in the water. It's just a cool game. I actually knew where all my high numbers were, and I still couldn't win. Yeah, the first time we played it, we were playing with your daughters, right? And they were trying to kick you out more than anybody. My daughters will murder me all over the place. That happens. They don't like letting dad live. (laughs) I was just trying to get one of them to survive to the shore. That's all I was trying to do. And I got a five there, but I only had one. (laughs) I think everyone else is dead. I'm like, seriously. Sounds 100% fair. (laughs) The other thing I really like about this game is the production quality. It's not really expensive pieces or anything really phenomenal as far as the materials they use, but it's just the attention to detail in these materials. For example, the three different terrains. You have the beaches, you have the forest, and you have the mountains. The beaches sink first, and they're the thinnest tiles. The forest sink second, they are slightly thicker. And the mountains sink last, and they are the thickest tiles. So you got a three-dimensionality to the board, and let's also have visual reminders which tiles sink first. We also met a really cool guy from Pittsburgh called Spike. He played with us on that game and Red Dragon Inn and Mission to Red Planet. And I think he played Terraforming Mars, too. But he played a lot of games. And he came back the next day, too. I believe he played at least one game with you, right, Dan? Was he the third in our game of Istanbul? Yes. Yes, he was. Oh, okay. It was fun meeting all these people, and I found two games that I wouldn't ride otherwise. One of them I'm very jealous that I didn't get to try was Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. So I'm interested in to see what you guys say about that game. That looks epic. I even like the floating thingy that you had up there that was just crazy. A lot of the crazy pieces in that game. <laughs> it's Gamelin Games, so I know a tiny epic line. You like that, Dan. I do. Well, I was going to hand it off to you, actually, Nathan. This was your copy that you brought to the con that you, me, and one other person played. Why don't you give the listeners high-level overview, as it were, and then we'll get into the minutia. <laughs> Heroes of Land and Sea is a Kickstarter game, and one look at it, it's pretty obvious, I think, that it's a Kickstarter game. I got an all-in pledge, so I have these three massive boxes that I've actually had to consolidate down to get them into those three massive boxes. I started with nine boxes, <laughs> it's consolidated it down to three. The base game is for four players. The base game is pretty good and generally what you're going to end up playing with. With all the expansions, you can play up to seven players, but I find it really hard to get that player count out. And if you have the full player count, 
one of the characters requires a floating island, which I was trying to set up and found it really kind of flimsy. And we ended up not using it in our game. 3D printer. Yeah, I might have to get my 3D printer actually working. <laughs> oh, that 3D printer. For my benefit, how do you play Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea? It's sort of a 4X. It's a dudes on the map area control game. You'd love it's it. my type of game. <laughs> you have four primary actions and four command actions. So the four primary actions, if you'd use your action token to go on one of these actions. Let me start weighing in, I guess. Yeah, just like, I don't know what I got myself into. <laughs> I was orcs, you were goblins, and our third player was merfolk. First of all is the production of the game. The reason why he tells you that it's a Kickstarter game is because this game has a metric ton of miniatures. Each faction has its own unique set of miniatures, which is crazy. <laughs> the map is divided into regions because it's obviously a due to the map game. There were four continents in our three-player game, and there's different terrain types. The terrain types generate resources if you've got your basic level dude on them, and the map actually has a very high level of connectivity, which is super important for this game. By that, I mean there's a relatively short distance between any space and any other space. Towers are one of the buildings that you construct, and towers have a cost and a victory point value based on the shortest distance between wherever you want to set them up and your capital. And I think this maxes out at about five. So any space is only five steps away from any other space. The combat system is actually quite good. So each faction basically has the settler unit, a warrior unit, and then three different hero units to deploy into combat. Combat starts pretty simply when one player moves into a space where that other player already is. And then you have a hand of cards and you each submit a card to combat. And the card has like a basic attack value on it that adds to your total power. Most of the cards cost resources to play. And situationally, the cards can counter other possible cards in each other's hands. Because there's like seven cards instead of three, it's not rock, say, paper, scissors, but it's rock, paper, scissors, S. Rock, paper, scissors, laser, Spock. My overall impression of the game was that it is pretty good. I tried to come up with some big negatives for this game, and I don't really have one except Nathan's comfy was almost overwrought with how much stuff he had. You could get the base plus like one expansion and not have that overwroughtness if you felt that that was too big of a limitation. The resource management is good. You take in these resources and then you spend them on units, towers, upgrading your capital, which really unlocks a bunch when you do that. And the action economy is good. Like Nathan was mentioning before, you have actions on your player board and it's just an action selection mechanic. So you select an action and then your opponents have an opportunity to follow because a subset of all the actions that are available to you, they can follow. And then if you have extra basic workers, the settler unit in your capital, you can use them to activate additional actions from the right side of your board, which is the actions that people can't follow. Yeah, I do like their action selection mechanism in this. And one thing I did find problematic is every race has a list of special abilities. So you have five different buildings you can lock that have three levels of special abilities you can unlock. Then you have three special units that each have three special abilities that you can unlock on them. Unlocking these abilities aren't difficult. You basically, as you upgrade your city, you automatically upgrade anything you've built. The problem is that just means there's tons of text on your player board that you're going to forget about. In every playthrough I've done so far, I've been disappointed because nobody really uses their abilities. And if they do unlock it, half the time they forget about it. So it's just too much information. Even after you've played it a few times, you're still forgetting about these things. Yeah, I kind of almost have to agree now that you mention it, because the races effectively start uniform and gain asymmetric powers as the game progresses. Sort of backwards compared to a lot of other 4Xs. Which I thought was a great concept. It's just you're basically adding new information as you go and it just becomes too much. There's a good possibility of player error where somebody's like, oh, I could have done that, you know, two turns later. I had this problem with Rising Sun. There's so many hours that you have and so many gods that you can get that it's near impossible to figure out how to perform a strategy because it's hard to track what the other players have. 
there's like eight gods out at one time. They have all these extra powers they bought for the thing. I'm like, well, I don't even know if I'm supposed to win this or lose this, or they're going to get more points if they lose. I'm like, I can't remember. Do you have that problem with the heroes of land, air, and sea? Like you just simply can't remember all the abilities all the other opponents have to make a good decision of whether your strategy is even good. I don't think I had that problem, but I could definitely see that problem happening. Especially for our first play, I'm mostly considered with what's in front of me. What abilities do I have? If I walked into a combat and somebody was like, oh, by the way, I could do this, I'd be like, you didn't even mention that before. I'd be disappointed, you know? In Rising Sun, we had everyone read off their cards when they bought them, but oh my gosh. When you have like 30 abilities, it's just like, oh no, 30 abilities times five. Uh, yeah, you don't not to worry too much about what the other person has as far as abilities, because half the time they're going to forget they have the abilities themselves. <laughs> That's That'd be beneficial. For that happened in Rising Sun, too. I will say one more good thing about this particular play of the game. Oftentimes, the first time into a brand new game, people sort of shy away from combat, even if it's a confrontational game, because they don't know what like the risks are or what the payoffs are. But we started mixing it up pretty early, like round two, maybe round three. And then every round after that, between when we started and the end of the game, there was at least one, if not multiple combats, which is actually quite good for a dudes on the map game. The flaws aside, if you completely ignore the racial abilities, it's still a really good game. That said, I don't think I'll get it to the table a whole lot. One, it's like a pain to take out and set up. And at the end, you always feel, oh, there's this thing I could have been using. Uh, I didn't really use it. I kind of want to try that. But next time you play it, you're going to forget to try that. <laughs> yeah. For Heroes of Land of the Sea, like I said, off the one play, I thought it was 100% solid. I don't usually rate a game after only one play, but I would give this another go. I wouldn't turn it down. I might even actively seek it out to see whether or not I could have some learning involved. But like, I almost have to mention that in terms of gameplay and how it felt for me to play through the game, not mechanically, just like the general feel, it was very close to tiny epic kingdoms and i know they're supposed to take place in the same universe if not the same era of the same universe kingdoms is also like area control dudes on the map game it just doesn't have amazing multiple sculpt miniatures it just has little wooden meeples it sounds like the game would really work if you played it a lot and just stayed with the same race but it sounds like you'd have to play it frequently oh yeah once you learn everything though might be a very different game I'm not sure I'll get to that point, though, with this game. I don't think you need to play one race to the point of mastery and then move on to another race. I think you could play one race a couple times and use stuff that you learned from that race into the next two to three races. Friday night, I ran a game of Firefly. Ah, okay. Yeah, no, I've heard a lot of good stuff about this one. I've heard it's compared to Shia, Legends of the Drift system. Which I might have just got. <laughs> <laughs> he did. I will say that it was disconcerting because I was trying to set up my game and people were like, what's that game over there? I'm like, I just fire a flaw. <laughs> <laughs> the game I'm not running. The table presence for this is phenomenal. Yeah. So I had set it up early. Everybody who walked in the building, they walked straight to this board game and getting excited. So how did the session go? Tell us more. Well, we'll start with what Firefly is. It's an IP-based game, Joss Whedon's Firefly, which unfortunately only lasted one season, but is considered a cult classic now. And this is a game that tried to be a sandbox game that throws everything that you could imagine from the show, and there's even characters that show up for half a second in this game, especially if you have all the expansions. It doesn't really sound like it'd be that great if you have too much going on, but I think it works really well. It keeps all the elements fairly simple, and they work together very well. You're picking up contracts from Nishka and Harkin. They can be legal contracts or illegal contracts, and the legal contracts are going to be simpler, but not going to have the good payouts, and you can have immoral contracts that, if you have moral characters, are not going to be too happy about that. But you go to these different planets, you can pick up supplies, you can pick up crew, so you're building up your crew. You, with every action you're doing, add the number of symbols you have in your crew and equipment to whatever you roll. Every time you roll six, you're supposed to roll again. doesn't happen a huge amount, but it's still entertaining when it does. You can have a challenge that should be impossible you roll a six and then you roll again and you roll another six. You actually achieve this impossible task by just sheer luck. And that can be really exciting. There's always risk every time you travel through space. You can mitigate if you had a strong crew. 
just simply go one space and do it safely and you'll never get anywhere. <laughs> I like how easy it is to teach, but yet be an awesome four or five hour game. You can have new players not feel that they're in trouble or anything. I really like Twilight Imperium. Twilight Imperium is not easy to teach. And it takes six to eight hours. If you're not familiar with the IP, the game is strong enough, you still will enjoy this game. The group that played the convention, they were just quoting lines from the show the entire time. And every card they flipped over swapped back memories and seemed to really enjoy. Even though there is a fair amount of downtime in this game, that downtime is spent talking and really kind of getting excited. Yeah, they seem to really enjoy it. Because the board is huge and there's so many cards. Each Planet Ego has its own deck of cards. Each person you can talk to to get contracts has its own deck. You have to have a large table to fit this game. But it also means people are standing while they're playing this game. Which makes it more exciting because you're actually moving around looking at things and physically active while playing this game. So, Dan, are you a Firefly fan? Firefly fan. I can't say that I am. I've caught a couple things that have come out the comic angle, but it hasn't really wowed me. I actually don't need to know anything about the movie to play the game. I haven't played Zaya Legend of the Drift System, but I know they're very similar games. That's what I've heard as well. The other thing I should mention about this is you get scenarios. So each game actually has different objectives. Now, the base game only comes with five or six different scenarios, but the expansion has a few, and you can go on BGG, and there's a couple hundred different scenarios you can download and play, and they're all really good, and they all are slightly different. Do you find that players try to pursue the objective? I mean, is it a race? Is it fast as possible? Or Each scenario is very different. But what I find in this game is people get caught up so much in the sandbox elements and trying to get the crew they want and do these different objectives. They almost forget about the goal. That's part of the reason why the game tends to go long. It's because people are enjoying the sandbox so much. It's like two hours in and then, wait, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be doing this. <laughs> That's a good problem to have. I was curious about that. Now, James, do you want us to tell now us? Now we can talk about Match of the Mazis. Mazis, time. It's time. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> As if we don't already know, what is Match of Madness, James? It is the game that when you open the box, it goes, awesome. <laughs> That's how it works. And it just light comes out of it, and then a tentacle. And then you run screaming away from it because it's Cthulhu. <laughs> but it's so good that you come back. Manchester Madness is a cooperative game based in the H.P. Lovecraft's universe, and it is app-driven. What's cool is you don't have to have Dungeon Master like you do with Descent or have anyone that has to be almost completely removed from the game, which is what the first Mansions of Madness was, where you were running the game, but you really didn't do much because you spent all the time making sure everything functioned right because there's a lot of rules. So the app unloaded all that and put it onto the software. So what's really cool about that is they were able to expand these different scenarios to be completely different. On the game night, we played Basic Vanilla, which is still epic. It's interesting, like, if I can get you to play a couple more of them, Dan, they are varied by a ton. There's a variable game setup. One that they recommend playing. I've played it at least five times, and every single time was different. It's really cool how the app integrates and randomizes each thing. Where that one, we're in a mansion, and we're trying to see what the trouble is at the mansion because the butler called us. In another session, we're actually in a moving train. And it's really surprising how the app and just these pieces simulate a train moving. One of them's got a full-blown murder mystery where you have to go talk to 800 bazillion people and figure out who murdered who. It's just really cool. In general, it takes the pacing into account. It's pretty good in saying, okay, you guys are taking too long. <laughs> if you can't figure things out fast enough, cultists start catching up and they start completing the rituals. Huge monsters start spawning out of everywhere. And I believe we ended up winning, but not by much. There were enough enemies on the board that if we had to defeat them all, we probably wouldn't be able to. No, yeah. The modular tiles allows the game to have this variable setup. By the way, this was the first app-driven game that I have played. And I am going to talk about the app a lot because I find that the way that it integrated the game super interesting. So one of the ways it integrates the game is it allows for the random setup. You pick a scenario and the app will randomize the layout of this mansion that you're all exploring, even though it's got the same like story beats. It does vary the story beats somewhat. I've played the same scenario twice. I wasn't even sure I was playing the same scenario until the very end. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, this, this was this, and they just changed the order a little bit. This person came out in a different place and did a few things that were slightly different. Right. And then the other big thing that the app does is it manages the game turn relatively well, but also does something really interesting with the combat system. 
in Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, which is the game that I have here at my house, when you're fighting a monster, it's always a strength test. If you've got certain special abilities and or relics or a spell, you know, you can toss a lore test in there to try to do damage instead. But it's always a strength test and it's always an observation test to evade them. It's always a lore test to cast a spell. The app makes it so that it's sometimes strength to attack, but sometimes it's agility. And sometimes it's agility to dodge, but sometimes it's observation, which I found pretty interesting because it creates additional variation within the game system. I think it would be unmanageable in normal circumstances with being able to take all these different monsters that you have available and make thematic attack and evade. Like the witches are really good at the magic. And when you try to attack them with magic, it's harder to not get hurt yourself and stuff like that. The sanity tests almost work the same way. Most of the time you're rolling lore, but once in a blue moon, you'll be rolling agility or strength because the thing that you're fighting is some physical entity like Deep One or a cultist. Yeah, I've played the first edition and this edition, and one of the biggest things the app does is cut the time down. What we finished in one hour would have taken three hours in the first edition, and it would have required somebody to play the cultist, constantly reference rules for each time they bring in this new creature. Everything had its own rules. It was less enjoyable. I thought it was a good game for the first edition. This new edition with the app is in my top ten. James, you should be smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm going to surprise you guys. It's in my top ten. <laughs> it might even hit my one. I don't know. It's fighting for one. We're going to see. The other thing that I found super interesting about the game in general and how the app helps you play is the investigation system. So when you start the game, the board is seated with these tokens, which represent things you can go investigate. And I found it very interesting that when these tokens started to thin out, that's when the mythos phase threw more enemies at us. Almost like the system treated these investigation tokens as a kind of threat yeah. and by clearing them it told the game oh there's less threat on the board because they managed to deal with it now i've got to toss monsters at them it looks at how well you're doing and then adjust the game to match that yeah if you do too well it gets pretty aggressive if you do poorly the game will actually literally get to the point i'll just kill you it'll end the game and you're dead you're like instant death not even in combat there's an instant death on all of them i believe if you get to that point Think of the first one, if the cultists completely finish the ritual, you die. But you got a bit of time. You had to be really bad. Okay. If not dead, at least mission failed, right? Yeah, mission failed. Yeah, but mission failed means they've summoned some great old one onto the earth and plane and everyone's dead. So, you know. The slower you get, the more monsters it'll keep throwing out. And it seems to put them closer and closer to the entrance to make it even harder for you to try to get out, actually. In a traditional co-op, pandemic, for example, the board is seated with disease cubes at the beginning of the game. So there's some threat on the table, and you clear some of that threat before things start getting hairy later on. And in this game, it was similar if you think of the investigation areas as threat. Like, you go to some place, oh, you find this item, or hey, make this test, and then you might find something. It's not threat per se, but when you clear, then the game starts spawning monsters at us. That always kept the tension, because you're like, oh, okay, well, there's always something interesting to do, or, oh, crap, <laughs> I'm going to figure out what to do. When we defeated that first monster, we had a good... I don't know, turn, or if not two, before the game threw more monsters at us. We had a tense point where that first monster showed up, and by the way, we were rolling piss poor against that first monster. Yeah, it was And it so took us like two to three rounds to take it down. Yeah. And we had a good at least two rounds of breathing space before the game threw more monsters at us. Yeah, that was pathetic. You tried to save Peter and I, and you just like threw the sword across the room. <laughs> That was so good. There was definitely a roller coaster to the arc of that particular play of the yeah. game, which was actually pretty enjoyable. Yeah, I thought that was hilarious. It's like, the guy with the sword comes, oh, he dropped the sword. What the heck? That was me, everyone. I was the guy equipped with the sword who walked into the room after two other players had already beaten on the monster a reasonable amount. And I was like, all right, sweet. I'll go ahead with the sword and maybe just take it out entirely. And then I botched my roll. App decided I critically failed and dropped my weapon in the room with the monster. Um, <laughs> that was hilarious. It was awesome. So that play was definitely pretty darn good in my approximation. And that is another game that I would give a second 
try to without a blink of an eye. One of the things I do like about it as well is it being Cthulhu, you never really have a positive ending. I mean, you can have the world ending if you lose, but even if you win, the game we played... We won because we, yeah, one guy managed to get out of the mansion. It was kind of questionable whether anybody else survived. But it doesn't matter because the camera stopped rolling and you can just see whatever you want. I don't know if anyone else survived. Peter didn't. <laughs> we sort of had a scenario where it was one person was very deep into the house and they had to move through several enemies in order to get out. The rest of us did almost a linebacker strategy where we engaged monsters so they couldn't chase him. That was cute, but we pulled it off. No one died, though. Peter went insane. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk about how going insane usually works? So sanity is random. So in the game, you have different ways that you can lose. Let's talk about characters dying. There's two different ways a character can die. Either they get enough wounds and they flip over to the wounded side and then they get enough wounds and then they die which is their heart number, which ranges between like four and eight. The other way is they get enough horror and their horror ranges between four and eight too. So once you hit your horror, you go insane. And then if you get your horror again, you die. A good portion of the insane cards have nothing on them. They're okay. The other half have multiple different things, including becoming a betrayer. But the betrayer cards are low minority. Most of them are like, you can't talk. You have to take the candle. You have to make sure you have a dagger by the end of the game. And I think that's the one Peter had. He had a dagger, but he couldn't ask for it. So yeah, as a group, we won. But Peter alone lost because he went insane and his insanity card specified that he needed to have the dagger at the end of the game in order to be able to declare a victory. Specifically, I think it says a weapon. Yeah, a sharp weapon. Yeah. I think he was looking for it. I had the only sharp weapon in the game. And he's not allowed to ever say what his thing is. So it gets a little creepy because you don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. And he comes up to you like, can I borrow your machete? <laughs> <laughs> and you know he's insane. Yeah. So you know it has something to do with that card he's looked at, but you don't know what he plans on doing with it. He might want your machete because the card says that he needs to kill the player sitting on his left which would be you james at the time yeah. <laughs> so i found that to be a really weird system but i mean it's interesting you don't want to go insane and there's more of a punishment for the horror and there is for the wounded now losing one of your two actions is super bad but you still manage it. It comes into like, you get wounded, okay. You get the horror, you're like, I want to do everything possible not to go insane. Although it can be quite fun to go insane. <laughs> it can. You had one where you couldn't talk, right? Yeah, I think we might have talked about it in a previous episode, but I, I had a lot of fun with that. I was just quietly humming and bouncing around and creeping out everybody at the table. <laughs> he was doing that before. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even say anything that said I couldn't talk. I might flip the table, I don't know. <laughs> Every expansion adds probably five or six. I think one added like 15 of them. My stack is probably about 200 cards. That's a lot of variety. How many scenarios are just the base game? Four or five. Given the replayability that those scenarios provide, that sounds like more than enough to play with. Though if you do get an expansion, those tiles are added to your inventory. The app will mix in those tiles randomly in the older scenarios, so it's not self-contained. You'll find a lot of the scenarios you're going to play repeatedly, because you can, and it's fun. I really want to play the train one with you, because I think you'll like it a lot. It's like a medium hard. I haven't played any of the three star ones, like the really difficult ones yet, because they're going to probably be insane. We did the easiest one by the skin of our teeth, so... Uh... I think I have about 18 of these scenarios already with all the expansions, so we got a lot of replayability with it. It sounds very deep, I'll grant you that. We did have someone that plays a lot of Cthulhu that was playing with us that was super happy about all the stuff. That's Tyler. Tyler, okay. He seemed to enjoy it a lot. I think I may even converted him to purchasing the game, so this is good. Yeah, he seemed to know a lot. I think he read a lot of the books and played a lot of the new games and board games and was really into it. I believe he was the one that was going to run the Call of Cthulhu RPG at the uh, library game day. He said he had some play experience with the LCG as well, I believe. I always wanted to play that LCG too. I have a friend from work that has a large bit of them. Wait, he might have the CCG, which may be interesting to play too, but Manches of Madness. I think I got you guys talked into it. Sounds like you really like it. We didn't mention the minis at all. There's so <laughs> many minis. So many minis. Each investigator has their own mini, and each different kind of monster has their own minis. We only saw, like, cultists, we spawned a stellar vampire, whatever the hell that thing was. I think it was a star vampire. I forgot all the large miniatures at home, so I was like, no! And we actually had to substitute 
he's something for the star vampire, yeah. but somebody showed me a picture of what one looked like. I was like, oh, oh my God. The miniatures are <laughs> just impressive and they don't even fit in anything. So I put them in totes and I have to bring those ones. There's definitely a, a very solid, two excellent thematic game in my book as well. <laughs> I think I'll completely get you over to the, oh my God, this game is so awesome camp once you get a couple different scenarios in. You might. You got to play Arkham Horror 3rd Edition at least once with me. I do. You do. If we get out of the house very often, but we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely have to play that. And that Arkham Horror the card game, that doesn't take all that long, right? I don't have the card game. I have the 3rd Edition board game. Oh, but that's still good, too. <laughs> that game doesn't take horribly long either, right? That's two or three hours. The box says two or three hours, and I have yet to have a play session take longer than that, even at the full player count of five players. Granted, we lost that scenario, but I'm very pleased with that. That's a scenario-based game, too, right? Yeah, the base box comes with four scenarios. It also uses tiles to create a map. The maps are preset based on the scenario, though. The variance is really the order in which monsters are spawned, the order in which the equipment and the bonuses come out, of course, because deck of spell cards and a deck of equipment and a deck of allies. That game has encounter tokens that you flip over. Each scenario has its own unique deck of cards, and these cards are seeded into these mini decks that represent the specific areas of the city. The cards actually do an extremely good job of tying the specific scenario to the specific area of the city. Yeah, sounds like a game I definitely want to try. Since we're talking about Cthulhu, I kind of want to mention what came in the mail today. Yeah, I saw pictures. I'm ready to strangle you, <laughs> but go ahead and talk to us about it. First of all, what is this game and why did you pull the trigger on it? So the game I'm talking about is Death Made Eye. Now, I opted out of getting the small child with this game. <laughs> if for people don't know, it's a, it's a giant Cthulhu statue that's also a playing board. That's probably like 50 pounds of plastic the size of a small <laughs> infant. Uh. So I didn't get that, but without that, it's still a massive game. The main reason I brought this game is Simon, Rob Davio, and Eric Lang. Eric Lang, yes. The greatest designer on the face of the planet. And that's really... <laughs> no, it's gonna... Are you gonna let me go? Okay. Because I'm right. <laughs> One of them. <laughs> we're not going to fight you on that because we know we're not going to be able to change your mind. Not that you're correct, but <laughs> we're not going to be able to change your mind. That is true also. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, no. We, <laughs> you can edit that part out, the not correct part. Yeah, slip you a 10. I actually do not know a whole lot about this game beyond that. As soon as I saw those names, I was in on this. The minis do look really phenomenal. I've just started tearing open the box and looking at the minis, and sculpts are super detailed. Not over-the-top grotesque. They maybe want you paint them, but... <laughs> Death May Die is going to be a uh, chapter-based game that... It's going to be interesting what you say when you play the game. Oh, yeah. And they actually have already broken it into seasons, so I actually have two seasons that I got with it. Yep. And each season has, like, six chapters, and then they have, like, mini chapters, which are your small box stuff. Yes, but it's very in-depth. It looks like you have tons and tons of hours on there. It'd be interesting to see how far you can get through it. The game has multiple episodes. Each episode is two acts. And it says the episodes are all standalone and are not contingent or being played in a certain order or with the same players. So if there is someone locking it, it looks like they got around like a true legacy element. Maybe it's just campaign based. Definitely not legacy in the fact that you're just ripping stuff up. Minimal version of that where you just open things. So maybe when you finish the first chapter, second chapter might not be cohesively part of it, but then you play a new game, you open it. I'm not sure. Nathan will have to tell me when he plays it. But. You can see these boxes with bosses. I mean, you know the bosses in them, but you don't know what these bosses are going to do. And I think that might be one of the large elements of the reveal. But yeah, I'll have to find out soon when I try it out. Fair enough. Looks like one I would play and I would probably die a terrible death in and probably enjoy it. Exactly. That's how a Cthulhu game should work. We are running a little long, but I kind of want to get Jim's impressions of Zulkin. Oh, yeah. Mansions of Madness. It's a really good game. <laughs> what? That's not Zulkin. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Zulkin. That was the first time I ever played Zulkin. I always wanted to play Zulkin. I just kept putting it off. Part of it's because I, I didn't know how I feel about the uh, gimmicky mechanic with the gears moving around. 
and how that actually plays into a Euro because I don't mind random and semi-area control games. That's awesome. Also, equally like Euros. And I do not like randomness in my Euros. What randomness is there in Zulkin? I mean, there's none. So in Zulkin, what I was afraid of is the gears made it random. But when I played it, I found that it doesn't. Yes. It's a very mechanical game, which I really, really like. I like Euros that are extremely mechanical and in all intents and purposes are straightforward, but have enough complexity to them that there's different routes to win. There's different valid strategies that you can employ during the game yep. to still win and you can switch it up in each game you can do mixtures you can do all this stuff i really really like zulkin i was really impressed and surprised by the game itself i really like actually how the gears work i like how in zulkin you can only do one thing on your turn you either place workers or take workers that's all you do when you place workers you place them on the gears and at the end of each round these gears move the actions you can take get better it's not necessarily true because it depends on what you're trying to do. But in general, the longer the worker stays in the gear, the better the thing you want to do is. But you don't want it to get past a certain point. The actions towards the end of each wheel are more powerful without a shadow of a doubt. And there's two at the very end. You better get off here. You could do whatever you want on the track. But if you don't get your worker off by the time the gear start touching again, you don't get anything. Yeah, SOL. I've never seen that happen because each of those gears has one or two spaces towards the end. It's basically like a wild card. You can pull it off and perform any of the actions on that gear, your choice. Now, I did have that happen once and I let it happen. And the reason why I did let it happen was because if you are the first player, you do have an option to spin the gear twice. Oh, yes. You can only do this theoretically once per game. But if you get to the top of one of the god tracks, you can flip it back, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do. So for all intents and purposes, you generally only have one time you can do this. We had one guy move it twice. So I put down another two workers because I figured that another guy wouldn't do it. And the second guy took first player. It's one of those euros that you keep first player until someone takes it away from you. But anyway, someone took it and then they moved the gear twice. I had a choice because you also have to feed your people too or lose points. So I could do that. Or I could pull this worker off that didn't help me that much. So I opted to place new workers down instead of take out, and I did lose a worker. It wasn't the end of the world, but it happened once. And we played it like three times. Not feeding your workers isn't the end of the world either. No. I played this game with my brother Ken, and I had five workers, and I was like a couple corn short, so two of my workers didn't get fed. So I took the six-point penalty. I still managed to eke out a decent victory on that game. The other reason I wanted the corn was because you generally need the corn to be able to place more workers than one. Because you can place one for free, or depending on how far along the gear you go, you might have to pay more corn. But if you want to place multiple workers, you do have to pay corn for every additional worker you place. So corn becomes extremely important in the game, and that's another reason to need it. The gears actually follow themes, too. Like, there's an agricultural theme one where you get your corn and stuff. There's a generalist one where you just get crap, so you get your stone. Corn wheels, definitely agriculture, because you cut down the forest for wood, and then you collect yeah. corn once the woods have been turned into fields. And the second wheel is all, like, resources, wood, stone, gold, for the most part. Right. I guess that would be your gathering wheel and then you have a technology wheel technology slash advancement because yeah. it's buildings technology and there's like one space on that wheel that allows you to go with the temple trap and then there's the trade wheel which is basically exchanging resources for various benefits and then there's the temple wheel which requires that you have the awesome crystal skull pieces to get various benefits the cool thing about that is you could throw your worker on there even without having the skull and then just get the skull along the way so there's a lot of timing in this game that's really cool too the first game, I was nice. Oh, what do you mean by that? There's three points on the wheel where you have to pay for your workers and you get different bonuses. But anyway, the important part is you can flip your card to push it to the feed phase. A turn early. Yeah. I did that twice in the second game because the first game, two people figured that out towards the end and did it. So at the second game, I'm like, okay, you guys know what you're doing now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I caught two people unawares on the first one because they don't expect you to do that. They're like, oh, yep, yeah, you have to pay for your people, lose a lot of points, have fun. So it sounds like you liked it. <laughs> I love that game. It's really cool. I also mentioned that I didn't win either of the games. Came close, but it's really fun to be like, okay, I can feed my people. Can Nathan feed his people? 
Oh no, I'm sorry, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah, because there are too many ways that players can interact in that game. It's actually to players' benefit to be on the same kind of action. Because if someone places on an early spot on, say, like the resource wheel, you can basically place your worker in front of theirs on that wheel by paying extra corn because that spot is now not empty and therefore kind of leapfrog and get more powerful actions sooner if more than one player's on the same wheel it's actually to everyone's benefit i didn't have the feeling and i don't think anyone else had the feeling at any point in the game that they were out of the game you can do a lot of stuff to thwart people's plans but they still can have plans like well obviously nathan needs a crystal so i'll just put all my crap here so you can't get a crystal in a reasonable amount of time but there's still other tracks you can get a crystal so there's lots of ways out i'm just making you pay more corn to do it i think it's a very solid game i didn't play it with the expansion at all Dan's played it with the expansion, right? Yeah, and I guess I'll chime in with that because just this past week at Board Game Club, I played with the Prophecies module of the expansion for the very first time. The expansion is modular and it contains basically three bits. Bit number one is some extra stuff that allows you to add an extra player to the game. So it allows the game to play up to five. And then module two is the tribes, which are oversized cardboard tiles that all have impronounceable names on them, but basically you dole them out at the beginning of the game as unique player powers, which is definitely cool. If given the opportunity to play with tribes or not play with tribes, I would play with tribes. And then Prophecies is the piece that I was avoiding for a long time because I thought it would make the game more complicated. This game has a lot of stuff going on, and a lot of people get distracted by the stuff that they can do and don't end up scoring the stuff that's worth points. I'm a very point-driven person, so that's all I pay attention to, but I did notice that a lot of people were more into collecting stuff. Yeah. I was mitigating point loss and gaining points is all I did <laughs> the whole game. There are things you do in this game that don't directly equal points like going up the tech tree isn't worth points but you want to go up that trek tree because of the bonuses that it provides yes the prophecy expansion adds this extra sideboard and special tiles to the game but only three of them are in the game so there's some game variability added there and each tile represents additional scoring condition at the beginning of the second quarter of the game, the first tile goes into effect and it creates a penalty for that quarter of the game. And at the end of that quarter, you score points. And usually these two things are related. So we had a prophecy tile that was like, whenever you go up a god track, you have to pay a resource cube. But at the end of this quarter, you are going to get victory points based on how many steps you are on this one specific god track. So that was actually a prophecy that I decided to invest in. I had tons of lumber because I was harvesting lumber from the corn wheel. I was on big corn, so I didn't actually need the lumber for anything. So I turned the lumber in to go up that track three or four times. During that quarter of the game, I just paid the extra cost. The bad news about the prophecy tiles is that if you don't do the thing that the prophecy tile is asking for at all, you do take a five point penalty. But usually just one of something is enough to avoid the penalty. So one of the tiles asked you to have workers on the chicken eats the temple gear. And it was like, oh, if you have zero workers, negative five points. But if you have even one worker, zero points. So the tiles, while potentially giving you negative points, are actually relatively easy to mitigate to get zero. So I actually felt that the prophecies tiles don't add too much complexity to the game. And I actually enjoy the additional scoring opportunities in the middle of the game. Because the base game, the only point opportunities are really the chicken eats a gear, the temple track, and building buildings. I love the mechanical aspects of it. It's visual. You can see what you want to do. My one minor bit of system is if you don't time things right, you might not be able to really do anything meaningful in your last turn. Does the expansion kind of deal with that a little bit? I would say that none of the expansions really deal with that. And I've experienced that as well. Because you go into the last turn of the game and you just kind of look at the board and you're like, okay, I guess I'm pulling off all of my workers. You're just trying to sequence your two or three workers so you net the most value out of them is usually how my last turn goes. And then if one guy doesn't really do too much, maybe you leave them on. Workers left on wheels is a 
tiebreaker in the event of a victory point tie, which is so uncommon in this game, it's not even believable. <laughs> I haven't seen it. The second game I played of that, someone got to the top of the god track and moved the gear twice. So you had one turn before the game ended. That skip at the end is horrific. I just pulled all my workers off. So the last round, I was like, okay. I guess I'm putting workers on. I don't even know at that point. <laughs> that was rough. We have a couple other things we could touch on. Empire's Age of Discovery, formerly known as Age of Empires 3. This is a game that's an evergreen for me. I've played it a few times, and every time I've played it, it's gone over really well. This is a half worker placement, half area control game where the first phase of the game is you're actually placing your workers on these action spaces to get people onto the colonies or get new workers or get ships or trade goods. And then the second phase is actually shipping your workers over to the colonies and trying to explore colonies and gain majority in these colonies to actually get points because most of the points come from area control. The thing I really like about this game is because it has that worker placement element, it is super easy to teach. I just went through each of the eight different action spaces and described what they do, and it took maybe five, ten minutes to explain how to play this, even though it's a relatively heavy Euro. The game's got different kinds of workers in it too, right? Well, you have basic workers, you have soldiers, you have builders, you have missionaries, you have captains, and... Each of these workers have bonus they give you if you use them in a certain spaces. But the nice thing about the worker placement is all that information is on the board. So you know that if you give your captain towards a ship, he counts as two. And for winning the ship, it's whoever has the most. You have missionaries that if you put them out on the colonized section, you get to take an extra worker with you. It's very clear, very concise. The scoring is fairly obvious. You never are unsure how you're doing, but you never really know who's winning. I wouldn't call the scoring necessarily obvious. You just kind of have a general feel, but like the more cards and houses you get, the better off you're going to be in general. You might not know exactly where you're at, but the more both of those things you have, you're generally going to do okay. There are a couple of different strategies you can take. A lot of the points come from area control, but also tons of money if you really invest in trade goods, which aren't necessarily giving you points, but you really have tons of money coming in. You have a lot more options of what you can do on your turn. There are variable player powers. Most of them are once per game. I don't usually even bother playing with them. They're interesting, but they're not that critical. <laughs> I vaguely remember seeing or possibly playing the first version of this game way back when. I didn't realize they had redone it. Yeah, the newer version, Empires, looks really nice. The other one was an early Euro game and looked like it. It did come with cool plastic bits, though, to its credit. Trip, trip. There's a odd thing where you have two sides of this board, but the one side can only play if you have a certain expansion, but I've never seen that expansion available. Jim, you played Nuns on the Run after the convention. What do you think of that? It was a fine hidden movement game. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> nuns on the Run is hidden movement, as you said. You have two nuns that are patrolling the convent, and you have the girls trying to sneak out of their rooms and get some little tokens that they're not supposed to have. So basically, you have the girls sneaking out and the nuns following a set path, and they can only deviate from the path if they hear one of these girls. So you basically, after every action, you're rolling a dice to seeing how much noise you made. You have a couple different types of movement that mitigate that noise. So if you're standing still... You have like a minus five to your roll. If you're running, you don't have any minus to your roll. The thing that's really makes this a fun game is the fact you can actually play up to eight players. It can actually become really chaotic and fun and it's really exciting. If one of the players is way too good, I can see it being boring. But for a family weight head and movement game, this is really strong. I know. We played twice in a row. First time, I almost got everything. I got the key, got the place, and I almost got back. Second time, I got the key. But the problem is, my daughters are not so good at the game. They enjoyed it, though. They did. It was a little frustrating when they're like, I got caught. I'm going to run in the most obvious place. Yeah, when I was the nun, I tried not to catch them too easily, but I also didn't want to make it obvious that I was doing that. Hopefully, they're not listening. I might give nuns and run another chance. There is a game I played for the first time after the convention, and it's Downforce. 
Dan, have you played this? Uh, no, but it made an appearance at one of our beer and board game club nights. And on its recommendation, I got it for the store. Some basic research on it. I thought to myself, hey, this looks like a something. Yeah, my understanding is that it's a racing game, but it's also a bidding game. Yep. And these two things interact quite interestingly. This is an older game that's been re-implemented and revised quite a bit by uh, Restoration Games. And first phase is... You're bidding on cars. Now, if you have six players, each person can get only one car. But the interesting thing is if you have fewer players, like if you have three or four players, you can have multiple cars. So you can win multiple bids. But every bid you win is money that you're taking out of your final earnings. And with these cars come a driver that has a power that applies to all your cars. One driver has the ability to get two extra spaces on all straightaways. One of the things that makes that really interesting is as you play, you're not just moving your car. You get these cards, they'll have anywhere from one car listed on them to all six cars listed on them. So when you play them, you actually have to move every car listed on your car. So even if it's not your car or the one you want to win, you have to move that. But there's like pinch points that you can watch for so you can try to get the car you want to win into this pinch point and block off everybody else and kind of cause the traffic jam. The other element that makes this really interesting is there's three points where you make a wager. So once the first car crosses these three lines, you bid on which car is going to win. It doesn't have to be your car. So if you're behind, you can bid on the winner and still win the game, even though your car lost. It's very streamlined. It's very easy to teach. It's very quick. The bidding, other than in the initial getting the cars, is set. The first one, I don't remember what it is. Nine million, six and three million. If you ever play Camelot, it's similar to that. More streamlined. It's a really good game. Super easy to teach. I think the rules can be boiled down into like two sentences. Mm -hmm. It was clear to me that the key point of it was when you play a card, you do have to move all the cars that are listed on that card, but you can sort of pick and choose which one to do in what order. You create a choke point so that the cars that you don't want to move ahead that far are moving last and then hit the choke point before they hit their full allotment. That's the tactical element of the game and how you control how things move. You actually have to move them in the order on the card. There is one driver that allows you to reverse that order. Oh, okay. You have multiple cards to pick from. Ah, I see. If you're really, literally strategic in the game, you actually don't want to slow someone down to the point where they don't have a chance at winning because you want people to bet for the wrong car at least on the first betting set. I see. If you eliminate somebody from the running on the race, it sort of narrows the spread on the betting. So it improves the odds of everyone else and makes the bid more clear. I get you what you're saying. So you don't want to be mean until at least after the first betting and then start screwing them over after they've placed their bets incorrectly, which they're probably going to bet for themselves because that has the highest potential payout. If you thrash someone, before you get to the first betting side, they're probably not going to bet on themselves, which is bad. And one of the important details is the very beginning game, you have your full set of cards in your hand. So you know all your movements can do in the game. You can do. You don't know necessarily what they have. You have a general idea because you don't have those cards, but you don't know how they're going to do it. So Yeah, you don't know the order that they're going to play those cards. There's a lot of strategy in the game and a lot of things you need to do to help improve the chance of you winning. So there's a lot in just having almost no rules to it. It's very simple, simple rule set. One of the interesting elements that I found when you have multiple cars is like what I did in one of the games is I was looking at my cards. Okay, I have like no movement for this one card that I ended up with. So I actually used all my high movements for that car first. So everybody bid on that car and kept my strong car behind. So I tricked people into bidding on the wrong car that I knew was going to lose. That's a lot of the game is you need to make people bid incorrectly. Somebody else has the good cards for that bad car of yours. Hypothetically, they can manipulate the game so that they bid on that car again and it ends up winning, right? Yeah. You also get points for if your car wins beyond what you bid. Okay. So it's going to be people trying to stop that car from winning and you know it can't win anyways. So there's that element too. There, there's a lot to it. If he has the high movement cards after the first or second bidding thing, he could ram it along the wall, make it take the long path. He could make sure it gets slammed in behind a car. I've played this game, I've played Camel Up, I've played Flamme Rouge, way above Camel Cup for me. I love Flamme Rouge, but I think it's better than that as well. Fair. Well, before we leave, thank you for listening to our podcast. Please like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram or Twitter, join our board game geek, Guild2989. Visit our website at tabletopgamingguild.com. 
the Tabletop Gaming Guild podcast is a product of the Tabletop Gaming Guild LLC. All rights reserved.
Um, so that was actually a prophecy that I had decided to invest in. I had tons of lumber because I was harvesting lumber from the, the corn wheel and I was on big corn. So I didn't actually need the lumber for anything. <laughs> uh, so I, I turned the lumber in to go up that track like three or four times during that quarter of the game. I was, I just paid the extra cost and got an extra points for it. Um, the bad news about the prophecy tiles is that if you don't do the thing that the prophecy tile is asking for at all, you do take a five point penalty, but usually just one of something is enough to avoid the penalty. So one of the okay. tiles asked you to have workers on the chicken eats the temple gear. And it was like, oh, if you have zero workers, negative five points. But if you have even one worker, zero points. So that the tiles while providing while potentially giving you negative points are actually relatively easy to mitigate to get zero. Okay. That sounds very So I actually felt that the the prophecies tiles don't add too much complexity to the game. And I actually enjoy the additional scoring opportunities in the middle of the game. Uh because the, the the base game, the the only points opportunities that there are are really the chicken eats a gear, the temple track and building buildings are the three big ones. Yeah, I also really like this game. Uh, I love the mechanical aspects of it. Is it's like, and it's very visual. You can see what you want to do. But my one, my one minor minor criticism is like there's a little bit of a downturn on the last on your last turn. If you don't time things right, you might not be able to really do anything meaningful in your last turn. Does the expansion kind of deal with that a little bit? Um, let me think about that. I would say that um, I would say that none of the expansions really deal with that. Um, and I've experienced that as well because you go into the last turn of the game and you just kind of look at the board and you're like, okay, I. I guess I'm pulling off all my yeah. workers because in order to get the most stuff done as possible, what this can, and then you're just trying to sequence it because maybe you've got two or three on the board, right? Um, maybe, maybe you've got less, but like you're just trying to sequence your two or three workers so you net the most value out of them is usually how my last turn goes. And Ooh. then if one guy doesn't really do too much, maybe you leave them on. Um, Workers left on wheels is a tiebreaker in the event of a victory point tie, which is so uncommon in this game. It's not even believable. <laughs> yeah, no, so, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I think that the second game I played of that, um, someone uh, got to the top of the god track. Yeah. And moved the gear twice ending the game. Okay. So they moved the gear twice. So we had one turn. Well, they, it was three spaces away. So everyone was like, oh, we can do stuff. So they moved it twice. So we had one turn before the game ended. So we went from like that skip at the end is horrific. Yeah, what a call it. I just pulled all my workers off. So the last last round, I was like, okay. I, I guess <laughs> I'm, I'm putting workers it. on. <laughs> I don't even know at that point. I, just, I was like, I don't even need this corn. I just put them everywhere. I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> that was rough. Okay. We have a couple other things we could touch on. I did play uh, Age of Empires. Again, I, this is a game that's like an evergreen for me. I've played it a few times, and every time i played it, it's gone over really well. Um, it's Empire's Age of Discovery. Age of Discovery. It's formerly known as Age of Empires 3. But this is a worker half worker placement, half area control game where you the first phase of the game is you're actually placing your workers on these action spaces to, you know, get people onto the colonies or get new workers or um, get ships or trade goods. And then the second phase is actually shipping all your their workers over to the colonies and and you know trying to you know explore colonies and gain majority in these colonies to get, actually get points because most of the points come from area control the thing i really like about this game is because it has that worker placement element 
it is super easy to teach. I just went through each each of the, you know, I think there's eight different action spaces uh, and describe what they do. And then we could start playing as, you know, it took maybe five, ten minutes to explain how to play this game. And it's even though it's a relatively heavy Euro. Uh, the game's got different kinds of workers in it too, right? Yeah. So you have, you got soldiers, you have, well, you have basic workers, you have soldiers, you have builders, you have missionaries, you have captains. And each of these workers have, you know, bonus they give you if you use them in a certain spaces. But the nice thing about the work placement is all that information is visible on the board. So you know that if you give your captain towards uh, getting a ship, he counts as two. And, you know, for winning the ship, it's whoever has the most in that spot at the end of the worker placement gets that ship. Um, you have missionaries that if you put them out on the colonized section, you get to take an extra worker with you so they bring in extra people with them so it's very clear very concise it's the scoring is fairly obvious and it's like you never are unsure how you're doing but you never really know who's winning so it's it's i don't know how i'd rather explain that i'm not don't think Sounds i'm like concordia Concordia, you have generally no idea who's winning. I wouldn't call it the scoring necessarily obvious, though that was sufficient experience in getting the game. You just you just kind of have a general feel that like the more yeah. cards and houses you need both, you get the better you're off you're going to be in general. You might not know exactly where you're at, but the more both of those things you have, you're you're generally going to do okay. Yeah. Uh and for everything, there are a couple of different strategies you can take with this. Obviously, a lot of the points come from area control, but also you're getting tons of money if you really invest in trade goods, which aren't necessarily giving you a point, but they really help you get that area control later and really get you like way ahead. If you really have tons of money coming in, you're, you have a lot more options of what you can do on your turn. There are variable player powers that most of them are just like once per game. I don't usually even bother playing with them. They're, they're interesting, but they're not that critical. <laughs> yeah, I, I vaguely remember seeing or possibly playing the first version of this game way back when, whenever that was. I didn't realize they had redone it, um, re-implemented it, I guess. Yeah, the the newer version Empires looks really nice. The uh, I didn't think the other one looked fa too phenomenal, but yeah, the, the other one was an early Euro game and looked like it. Um, it did come with cool plastic bits, though, to its credit. True, true. Uh, there, there's a odd thing where it's like you have two sides of this board, but the one side can only play. If uh, if you have a certain expansion, but I've never seen that expansion available. Hmm. Uh, other than that, um, Jim, you played Nuns on the Run well, short after the convention. How, what'd you think of that? <laughs> um, it was a, it was a fine, um, Hidden movement game. Wow. <laughs> so Nuns on the Run is hidden movement, as you said, but basically what you have in Nuns on the Run, you have two nuns that are trying to that are patrolling the the convent, and you have the what's the word for these girls? Uh, the uh, whatever students are, they call them something, but trying to do go go and you know sneak out of the rooms and do something and like get some little tokens that 
they're not supposed to have. So basically, you have the girl sneaking out and the nuns following a set path. And they can only deviate from the path if they hear one of these girls. So you're basically, after every action, you're rolling a dice to seeing how much noise you made. But the, you have a couple different types of movement that mitigate that noise. So if you're standing still, you have like a minus five to your roll. If you're running, you have don't have any minus to your roll. So the distance you can hear is much greater. Uh, but the nice the thing that's really makes this a fun game is the fact you can actually play up to not uh, up to eight players, and so it can be for a hidden roll game. It can actually become really chaotic and fun, and it's like really exciting. It's like if it be, if one of the players is like way too good, I can see it being boring. But you know, for a family weight get hidden roll. Head and movement game, this is really strong. I know we played twice in a row. The first time I almost got everything and got the key, got the place, and almost got back. Second time I got the key. But the problem is my daughters are not so good at the game. They enjoyed it though. They did. It did. It was a little frustrating when they're like, I got caught. I'm gonna run in the most obvious place. Yeah. I tried yeah, when I was the nun, I tried not to like catch them too easily, but I also didn't want to make them make it obvious that I was doing that. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. they're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I might give nuns a run uh, another chance, but yeah, there's that. There's a game I played for the first time after the convention, and it's Downforce. Yeah. So Downforce, Dan, have you played this? Uh, no, but it uh, made an appearance at uh, one of our beer and board game club nights, and uh, on its recommendation, I, I got it for the store. Uh, so I did uh, some, you know, just basic research on it before I picked it up for the store, and I thought to myself, hey, this looks like a something. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my understanding is that it's uh, it's a racing game, but it's also a bidding game. Mm -hmm. And these two yep. things interact quite interestingly. Yep. Yep, so, Rob, it's a... This is an older game that's been re-implemented and revised quite a bit by uh, Restoration Games. Uh, and basically, in this game, what you're doing is... First phase is you're bidding on cars. Now, if you have six players, which is the max, each person can get only one car. But the interesting thing is if you have fewer players, like if you have three or four players, you can have multiple cars. So you can win multiple bids. But every bid you win is money that you're taking out of your final earnings. Uh, and with these cars come each, each bid, you get a power a driver that has a power that applies to all your cars and it could be something like uh one dri one driver has the ability to get two extra spaces on all straightaways one of the things that makes that really interesting is as you play you're not just moving your car you get these cards they'll have anywhere from one car listed on them to six car all six cars listed on them so when you play them you actually have to move every car listed on your car. So even if it's not your car when it, or the one you want to win, you have, still have to move that. But there's like pinch points that you can watch for, so you can try to get your car, the car you want to win, into this pinch, po pinch point and block off everybody else and kind of cause a traffic jam. So that, yeah, even though you're playing, allowing the yellow car that you want to lose to move six spaces, it just hits this traffic jam and it doesn't actually move those six spaces. Uh, the other element that makes this really interesting is there's three points where you uh, make a wager. So once the first car crosses the first these long, each one of these three lines, you bid on which car you're going to think you is going to win. It doesn't have to be your car. So if you're behind, you can bid on the winner and still win the game, even though your car lost. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool. It's pretty. It's very streamlined. It's very easy to teach. It's very quick. The bidding, other than in the initial getting the cars, is set. Like the first one, you I don't remember what it say nine thousand. The second one is three thousand, and the third one is 
a thousand. I don't remember what it is. Million, but nine million. What a million? Yeah, whatever that is in there. So you don't have to say like I'm betting eight and I'm betting blah whatever. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, if you ever play Camelot, it's similar to that, just mm-hmm. like more streamlined. It's it's a really good game, super easy to teach. I think the rules could be boiled down into like two sentences. Yeah, yeah. I, I and in my research of the game, it it was clear to me that the 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 key point of it was the fact that uh, when you play a card, you you do have to move all the cars that are listed on that card but you can sort of pick and choose which one to do in what order and like you say you create a choke point so that the cars that you don't want to leave move ahead that far are moving last and then hit the choke point before they hit their full allotment so you that's the tactical element of the way of the game and how you control how things move well you have to you actually have to move them in the order on the card Oh, okay. There is one driver that allows you to reverse that order. But um, you have multiple cards to pick from. Yeah. Yeah. All right. um, and the problem, too, is or if you're really, really strategic in the game, you actually don't want to slow someone down to the point where they don't have a chance at winning. Because you don't want to do that towards the end because you want people to bet for the wrong car, at least on the first betting set. So, I see. If you eliminate somebody from the running on the race, it sort of narrows the spread on right. the betting, right? So, so it improves the odds of everyone else and makes it the the bid more clear. I get you what you're saying. Yeah. So you don't want to be mean until cl- at least after the first betting. So you want to try to make it seem like everyone can still win and then start screwing them over after they've place their bets incorrectly, which they're probably going to bet for themselves because that has the highest uh, potential payout. Potential payout. So you want them to do that. Like if you just sort of just thrash someone before you get to the first betting site, they're probably not going to bet on themselves, which is bad. And one of the important details at the very beginning game, you have your full set of cards in your hand. So you know all your movements you can do in the game. Well, you can do, but you don't. What you can do, yes. You don't know necessarily what they have. You have a general idea because you don't have those cards, but you don't know how they're going to do it. So, yeah, you don't know the order that they're going to play those cards. So, right, right, which is a big part of the game. So there, there's there's a lot of strategy in the game, and, and and a lot of things you need to do to help improve the chance of you winning. It, so there's a lot in just having almost no rules to it. It's very simple simple rule set one of the interesting elements for that i found when you have multiple end up with multiple cars is like what i did in one of the games is i I was looking at my cards okay i have like no movement for this one card that i happened to ended up with so i actually used all my high movements for that car first so everybody bid on that car and kept my like my strong car behind so i just kind of like tricked people into bidding on the wrong car that i knew was going to (laughs) lose So a lot of that's a lot of the game is to you need to make people bid incorrectly. I mean, you can't win if you don't. Some somebody somebody else has the good cards for that bad car of yours, though, right? They're, yeah. They're, hypothetically, they can manipulate the game so that they bid on that car again, and it ends up winning, right? But you know, yeah. You also get points for if your car wins beyond what you bid. So okay. they may actually, they're more likely to, there's a, there's going to be people trying to stop that car from winning and you know it can't win anyways, too. So there's that element, too. There, there's a lot to it. Like, he, if he has the high movement cards for his thing, after the first or second bidding thing, he could ram it along the wall, make it take the long path. He could make sure it gets slammed in behind a car. There's other stuff you can do. I mean, I've played this game. I've played Camel Up. I've played Flam Rouge. I this is way above Camel Cup for me. It's better. I love Frit Flam Rouge, but I think it's better than that as well. Fair. Anything All else? Right. I think I think we've got enough. 
yeah. personally. I, think I can I'm... show you my newest acquisition. Well, what's that? Let's go, let's go ahead and see that, but let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, oh, you did a post about that too. You got yeah. your priority game. I got my priority game. It's uh, not quite what I expected. We're still we're we're struggling with it because uh, there's been rule updates since the publication. So, but we played it massive. The the map is massive. Um, we we played it twice and we played it co-op once and failed miserably. And when we then we played uh, competitive once and Ken won by a solid ten points. But like the score track goes up to sixty and he won at like twenty three or something like that or maybe it was 33 so i think we're missing something uh in terms of how to ramp up and take on the bigger threats so uh i'll do some more research maybe i actually do think like one of my biggest design things of a game is if in the normal play of a game if you can lap the scoreboard the score i think personally the scoring is incorrect if on, an av- if on an average, like Lords of Waterdeep is one of them. Like, I mean, but the, the game, the, the game comes with components that allow you to loop the scoreboard. Right. They don't come with components that allow you to loop the scoreboard twice, which I have seen happen. Yeah, I, once. I've done that. Uh, <laughs> or uh, Champions of Midgard or uh, Blood Rage. Blood Rage, you always lap it. Like, uh, Rise- and Fortia can easily break a hundred. Yeah. Uh, two. I rather see them half the points, and and make it so it's really hard to get to that top thing. Because it, the, my point is like that the scoring track. I like it to be a gauge of being like this is the level, the highest general level you could ever get. Not like if, if the track goes from zero to hundred, you want hundred to be a a, a really good game. Yes, like, really good game. Like I'm your, you want your the, perfect game. You want game. the game to communicate to you that you did really well that play, right? right? Not that I laughed it three times, and I'm like, I guess the third time is the charm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. There's a lot of times where, it's, you know, the first time I play a game, it's like, is that a good score? I don't know. <laughs> uh, terrifying. James, what were you, what were your scores in Zolkin? I'll tell you what I always score in the game after. But I want to hear what you saw in your your play. I don't actually remember the score, but I know no one lapped the board or lapped the scoreboard. Oh, yeah. No, I've never lapped the scoreboard. So, so yeah, Yeah. Uh, in, in uh, the vast majority of my Zulkin plays, I have ended the game at exactly 55 points. Okay. Um. Yeah. If I end up at less than 55 points, uh, I have tried to do something that has failed. Twice, I have gotten exactly 75 points. So, Zulkin, I was thinking, was a good example of a game that has the scoring track correct. Terraforming Mars is another one that I think has the scoring track correct. Yeah, uh, I don't think I've ever seen anybody break 100 points on Terraforming Mars. I think I hit 90 once, barely. I just don't think design-wise there's any point. Like, they could have made any of the games like Blood Rage or uh, any of them where you just lap, uh, or Champions of Midgard where you just lap the board repeatedly. It just, they could have just changed the point scoring to not have that happen. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's something to be said about, like, I lap the board, but if you do it every game, it's just sort of like, oh, crap, okay. I don't know what my high score should be. Uh, and I've had games of, um, uh, what was that game again? Uh, Lords of Waterdeep, where we wa- we lapped the board twice. Yeah, I, I've seen that I've, happen once. Yeah. Just cut the points down, half them, quarter them. Whatever I guess needs it's to be a, done in order to make the scale correct. Yeah. I don't know. That's just a personal what call, A lot too. of. Uh, uh, a lot of I feel like a lot of game designs. There's a certain amount of balance between like the actions that you do and the victory points that are handed out, uh, or you know, cost versus rewards, right? Yeah. A- and um, I think I think for some games, I think that 
the probably the designer might have tried to increase or decrease the number of points that things gain, were giving out, and but that just requires them to redo the math on all their cards, for example. Um, yeah. Well, so. Lords of Waterdeep has cards that give you 40 points. I think there's the highest ones on there. And it's really hard to gauge that 40 points is good or not when you can lap the board twice. Because you're like, well, is that really worth it? Because I could just do 800 small <laughs> quests and just go crazy. Yeah, uh, the uh, bigger problem I think with that is like if you lap a player, I think that oh, can yeah, be no, kind of happens. a really negative feeling. Lords of Waterdeep, that happens all the time. Yeah, Blood Rage, it happens sometimes too. Yeah, Blood Rage, you can lap players, and Blood Rage, I lap Blood Rage, you lap players more often than any other game. Blood Rage, I've I've lapped people tons of times. I've yeah, lapped, it almost came back to them. It's it's not really entirely satisfying when it's like okay, I know I win. Now my next goal is just to see who I can lap, and it's really kind of frustrating for the people that are you're lapping. I'm sure. Problem with the, well, a game like Blood Rage. The problem with the only, I love Blood Rage. It's a super awesome game. But if you Blood Rage is a game that you um, almost can't play against experienced players, right? Unless they don't play or like I. If I play against someone that doesn't have never played Blood Rage, I make sure that I do a balance strategy where I pick most of the different ones, or I'll purposely not max out my Loki strategy or uh, the uh, Tyree strategy or any of the single god strategies that just go nuts. Um, so I try, I try not to get all the combos that I need to have just to go yeah. crazy. That can be said about a lot of Euros. Like, you generally, if you aren't really experienced at a game, you've played a lot of times, you're generally going to be want to go easy on somebody you're teaching. Some of them aren't as bad as Blood Rage. Blood Rage is literally like, if you do not draft eight properly, you just gave someone the win. Sort of the same issue with uh, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, if you don't play... Uh, optimally, and you play against someone who's played a lot, you just you can't beat them. They'll also get mad at you too if you pick the wrong roll. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, Dan. What do you think? Does this not bother you as much as it bothers me? Well, I I can't think off the top of my head any instance where I've been lapped or I have lapped someone else off the top of my head on a score track. No, you want those blood rates? Like <laughs> like that? <laughs> um, uh, maybe. Maybe maybe I'll play for a race once and let you stomp on me just to have that experience. Um, I, I I mean sometimes the track is just an even number to make the counting easier. Yeah. If it goes to if the track goes zero to a hundred and a say average score is. 110 to 125 then that's fine right yeah and the the other thing too is i i do appreciate what lord is water deep that have the uh and castles of burgundy they already know that you're gonna lap the board because they didn't do that so they give you little chips and stuff that you get when you go past yeah, it they indicate that um, you're plus 50 or whatever yeah blood rage doesn't do that blood rage has nothing you're gonna lap the board but, like, know, you don't stack things on top of each other or know that you lapped the board other than you lapped it. So I do like I do like that other games have that if they're going to not keep that as the high score sort of thing. But, yeah. I think you would like Blood Rage, though, a lot. No, I... I, I, I the, the, the one time I, I've managed to play it with you, by the way, it oh, was, did you? It okay. Was fine. Yeah. 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 Oh, that was at the library, wasn't it? I think I came in third. Yeah. At, out of a group of five, so I did okay. I I held my weight. <laughs> it is a fun game. It's it's definitely uh, I I mean the greatest games I ever played are against people that played it a ton. So that, it's just one of those games that is fun, and then you get it, and then it's really good when you get the hyper competitive ones. So everyone knows exactly what they're doing. Everyone's played it a lot. 
that's one of the just games that just super shines at that point. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, probably should wrap up. Uh, there is another game I want to talk about, but we could probably save that for next week. That I put. Probably a good idea. <laughs> um. Oh, you definitely need to do a review on your piratey game, Dan. Yeah. A review? What kind of review yeah. are you thinking? Just one that tell us whether you like it or not. <laughs> or actually, uh, probably, probably that's a that seems like an epic game, so you should probably... What is the name of that game? It's called The Pirate Republic. It was kickstarted previously this year. Um, uh, I found it in my digging deep into Board Game Geek for good thematic pirate games. Um, it's it's a weird one uh, because uh, the core mechanism is deck building, and the the cards in your deck have effectively combat symbols 